Uh, I'm Peter Malkin, and I'm here right. to uh, talk with you and to introduce our speaker. But first, I would like to uh, pay heed to our chair lady, Davida Strackbein of the Greenwich uh, Historical Society, and our executive director, uh, Deborah Mackey. Uh, the Greenwich Historical Society, I think of as a, a somewhat hidden jewel in the crown of the town of Greenwich. Uh, you'll hear more about it uh, as we go along, uh, but you should know that the Bush Holly House, which is part of the main part of the campus, is the only National Historic uh, Registered Landmark in the town of Greenwich. Uh, and it's where uh, the American Impressionist movement started. It's where Child Hassam, Weir, Trackman, uh, all uh, came and s painted. Uh, coming out of New York City when the railroad came up here in 1848, 1850, uh, escaping into the wilds to uh, paint in plein air. Uh, the society uh, has a marvelous archive, which is the real uh, special place where the history of Greenwich is kept. Uh, the society recognizes historic houses, uh, placking the houses that qualify both by age and quality. Uh, and the society has had a series of exhibitions uh, that are relevant to today, uh, starting first with the Italian American community of Greenwich, uh, where uh, the descendants of the people who came mostly from two small towns in South Italy and built most of the walls and most of the landscaping in Greenwich, uh, the Italian-American community, and of course today, the first selectman, the superintendent of parks, the superintendent of the Department of Public Works, all Italian-Americans. Um, the next one was the Japanese community uh, in Greenwich. I think most of you know that the Japanese school, the Greenwich Japanese school, uh, is uh, a unique uh, school which uh, teaches, originally intended to teach the children of executives of major Japanese corporations temporarily here in the United States. So these children could go back to Japan uh, and get into the finest, uh, what we would call private schools in Japan with their continued Japanese education. Um, the Japanese school uh, shares with the Carmel Academy, which was the uh, Westchester and Greenwich Hebrew Academy, uh, the grounds of uh, what was Rosemary Hall, where my wife attended in the early 1950s. Uh, and so really represents an amazing uh, move in the history of the town of Greenwich uh, to uh, parts of our community uh, that for uh, centuries were not really welcome uh, and now play an important part in uh, Greenwich. Um, our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Ann Meyerson, uh, has been the guest curator of the exhibition or exhibit currently at the Greenwich Historical Society called An American Odyssey, the Jewish Experience in Greenwich. Uh, Ann uh, has curated a number of major exhibitions uh, at the uh, Brooklyn Historical Society uh, and uh, recently co-curated an exhibition uh, at the New York Historical Society, uh, The First Jewish Americans, Freedom and Culture in the New World. Uh, and then recently, uh, with firmness in the right, uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Jews. Uh, the, uh, she also was responsible for the 22,000 square foot core exhibition at the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, which is a wonderful museum, uh, really worthy of visiting. And as I said, is the guest curator of the Greenwich Historical Society's landmark exhibition, An American Odyssey, The Jewish Experience in Greenwich, uh, which will be uh, open to the public through April 15 of uh, this year. And uh, as you leave, you will find a basket, I hope, 
and in the basket you will find some materials uh, about the Greenwich Historical Society, and uh, they include uh, a small ticket which will uh, give you, as members of the GRMA, uh, the right uh, free of charge to visit the exhibit uh, and see for yourself uh, what Anne will speak about today. And I have to say that there will also be uh, a, a membership card for the Historical Society for those of you who would like. The image above uh, is the new or reimagined campus of the Greenwich Historical Society. Uh, on the lower right is Toby's Tavern, uh, which was the railroad hotel and then was the tavern uh, that the Impressionist artist uh, used. Uh, up above it uh, is the, the new construction, uh, which is a major new uh, archive facility and reading room, and two exhibition galleries, uh, one for a permanent gallery in which the uh, Impressionist paintings will be on display, many of them actually painted in and portraying the Bush Holly House, and uh, a flex gallery for visiting uh, exhibitions. Uh, and uh, so the construction is well underway. Uh, the opening is tentatively scheduled for September 27th, uh, when the entire town will be welcome to see this new addition. In the upper right-hand corner is uh, the Bush Holly House itself, uh, which goes back to the 1700s uh, and is uh, where uh, the artists uh, did their work. So uh, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming uh, Anne Meyerson, Dr. Anne Meyerson. Thanks, Peter, for that lovely introduction. Before I begin walking you through this exhibition, I'd like to share a bit about how it came about. When I was first approached to do an exhibition on the history of the Jews of Greenwich, my first thought were, are there Jews in Greenwich today? Now, a lot of people um, from outside the town do not um, are not aware that there is still, that there is such a sizable and um, vibrant community of Jews in Greenwich today. And I was sort of suffering from that same stereotype. But I soon learned that that wasn't the case, that there are really about 11% of the population is Jewish. Okay, so that, that's what I understood, which was an interesting um, shift in my thinking. So then my next question was, when did they begin to settle in Greenwich? And how did they get to this part of the world, a strange land where there was essentially no Jewish population? I learned that this was a little known story. There were books written on the Jews of Stamford, the Jews of Fairfield County, of um, the state of Connecticut, of Hartford, but no secondary sources on Greenwich. So I had to dig into primary sources to find out what was the particular trajectory of this community. Was their path like those taken by the Jews of neighboring Stamford, for example? Well, yes and no, I learned, but more on that later. Okay, on to the exhibition. You're looking at our signature image of the exhibition, the favorite shoe store started by I.J. Weiss in 1906, one of the founders of the Jewish community of Greenwich. Well, what does this photograph tell you? Well, it's a storefront on Upper Greenwich Avenue of a shoe store. It's emblematic of the story that we're telling of the first Jews to settle in Greenwich because small retail businesses were how this community gained a foothold. How did we find this out? One of the keys to unlocking the stories of the early Jews of Greenwich was the, at the Greenwich Public Library. The library had conducted oral histories of many of the first families, family members in the 1970s who were now the elderly children of the first Jewish pioneers. Here was a treasure trove of memories. The Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County, located in Stamford, was also a critical source at the start. They hold many photographs and ephemera from the Greenwich's Jewish community. 
From these oral histories, I selected six emblematic families who were founders of the Jewish community. The Weiss family, the one you see here, was one. And they settled in the town again in that first decade of the 20th century, which was a very long time ago, I was surprised to learn. Then there were the Cohens, the Marxes, the Tunics, the Taylors, and the Bennets. Those were my six. Through them, we would tell the broader story of how the Jews came to live in Greenwich, how they gained an economic foothold, how they both strove to integrate and also remain distinct in the town. Their stories form the core of the show. Almost all of the Jews who settled in Greenwich, I learned from these oral histories, came around the time that I.J. Weiss did, at the turn of the 20th century. But there actually were Jewish property owners in Greenwich as far back as colonial times. Grace Mears Levy, whom you see here, was from a wealthy Jewish family from New York who married David Hayes, another New Yorker, who together with his two brothers owned Bush Holly House, we were surprised to learn, for a short time, beginning in 1728. We think mostly for speculative real estate reasons that they really didn't live in the house. But between 1736, when the Hayes brothers left, and 1899, over 150 years, there was essentially no Jewish presence in Greenwich. Why? One reason was that Connecticut and Massachusetts were run by Puritans who were not welcoming to any religions outside of their own. Other colonial cities along the Atlantic coast, like New York, Newport, Philadelphia, Savannah, Charleston, were the places where the first Jews to come to North America settled and where they were more welcomed. In fact, Jews didn't win the right to worship publicly in Connecticut till 1843, as shown here from the Connecticut State <coughs> Statutes of 1849. And it says, Jews who may desire to unite and form religious societies may have the same rights, powers, and privileges as are given to Christians of every denomination by the laws of the state. Uh, this 1843 change in the law was actually uh, as a result of petitioning by the Jews of Hartford and New Haven. But interestingly, Jews in New York City had won this right in 1729, over a century before. The oral histories tell us that five of the first six settlers were born in Russia and its Eastern European territories. The sixth was the son of a Russian-Polish immigrant. They came from the Pale of Russia, of Tsarist Russia, the area in which Jews were forced to live for centuries. This is a typical marketplace town in Poland where a majority of the population was Jewish. And trade and peddling were common, common ways that they were able to make a living. And you can see the push carts and the wagons. So I learned that the first Jews to settle permanently in Greenwich came with this mass migration from Eastern Europe. They didn't come with the colonial migration that stemmed from the Inquisition and the diaspora from Spain and Portugal. They didn't come from the mid-19th century one from Central Europe, which is known as the German Jewish migration. But they came with this migration between 1880 and 1920 of two million Yiddish-speaking Jews. This two million represented nearly one-third of the Jews living in that area of Russia or area of Europe, whole towns emptied out. Why did they leave? They were fleeing anti-Semitic riots, expulsions from Moscow and other cities, and a major pogrom in 1903 in Kishinev that you see here, as well as worsening economic conditions and a fear of military conscription, which was for a very, very long time. Unlike many other immigrant groups to the West, they rarely considered returning to their lands of origin. America represented unprecedented freedom for Jews. Fanny Taylor, the future wife of Michael Taylor, another of the first Jewish merchants to settle in Greenwich, 
is shown here with her younger sister Mimi. They emigrated from Eastern Europe by themselves at the ages 12 and 14, around 1881, which was another year of renewed pogroms in Russia, to stay with an uncle in Philadelphia. Fanny and Mimi's mother had been killed in a pogrom, and their father had remarried their mother's sister, shown here. Their father and stepmother remained in Europe. This samovar and the photograph that you just saw of, Mimi's fam of Fanny's family were acquired by reaching out to the descendants of these oral history narrators to gather artifacts for the exhibition. Through no small effort, we were able to actually track down many of these descendants so many generations later. I long for the specific artifacts that the oral history narrators talked about, the colorful tin cans used to store coffee and tea in Cohen's grocery store, the junk bells that Barney Tunick had on his junk wagon. We found the bell, but sadly not the tin cans. This Russian samovar was brought by Barney and Sarah Tunick and speaks directly to the migration of these founding families from Russia. And you can see it in the exhibition. And here's Barney and Sarah Tunick. How were these immigrants received? This was published in the newspaper of record in neighboring Stamford, which received a much larger immigrant population than Greenwich, but the viewpoint is telling. It's from a Congregationalist minister's sermon in 1892. It says, if the threatened invasion of Asiac Asiatic cholera through a filthy mass of disgusting Russian Jews shall lead to the exclusion of undesirable Europeans, the pestilence will prove a blessing in disguise. How did these Jewish mer newcomers get their start as small merchants in Greenwich? Well, as many Jews did at that time, they started with peddling wares door to door, which is like a holdover from Europe, often by horse and wagon, shown here on the, the left, some began traveling, by, uh, for, traveling for the day by train or trolley from nearby cities like New York to towns in Connecticut like Greenwich to find less competition when they were peddling. In due time, they accumulated enough capital and decided to settle in these towns and open small retail stores. Four of the six came to Greenwich via Porchester which was a growing industrial center, had a sizable Jewish population, and it was just three miles over the border in New York from Greenwich. They had family there. You can see from this postcard in 1905, around the time the community started in Greenwich, how built up Porchester was then, especially as compared to Greenwich. Here's a quote from Sadie Cohen Seinberg speaking to her family's roots and connection to Porchester after settling in Greenwich. We used to go to my grandmother's in Porchester and it was like a holiday, you know, and then we'd go to the temple there and there were a lot of young children there, you know, not like here. Porchester was a big Jewish community. I used to love it. I felt sorry when they started a temple here. There are Quotes from these oral histories sprinkled throughout the show, and you can also listen to short audio recorded excerpts from five of the six telling the story of how their parents got started in Greenwich. The, the library saved, actually, the oral um, history recordings. So, our six Jewish families, shortly after settling in Greenwich, all together started two grocery stores, two newspaper routes, a junk business, and a shoe store. Again, they were peddlers and small shopkeepers, not factory workers, not manual laborers, not farmers, like other ethnic groups who had immigrated here. So let's start with the story of the Cohens. Here's what Katie Sadie Cohen, again, says about how her father started Cohen Brothers grocery store that you see here. He wasn't married when he came here, and he went into business with a brother, and that's why it was called Cohen Brothers. But he and his brother didn't get along, 
So they separated after one year, but he never changed the name. And I remember we had a veranda in front of our apartment, and it was very lovely to sit out there at night. And you can see the veranda. And we were very excited when this photograph that we found in the Historical Society matched up with her oral history and memories of that veranda. The building is no longer here on Greenwich Avenue. So Meyer Cohen was the first Jewish merchant to open a store in 1899, and he started out as a fruit peddler. It seems he was born in America, but his parents were Russian-Polish Jews who had settled in Port Chester. They had several sons, and each one picked out a different direction in which to peddle, with Meyer choosing Greenwich. Uh, Meyer's future wife, Ida, had emigrated from Eastern Europe to New York City with her family, and hearing of a, quote, family of fine boys in Porchester, her family moved there, and Ida and her sister ultimately married two of them, Ida's husband being Meyer Cohen. And here's Meyer Cohen in 1922. Jenny Marks Levine, daughter of Philip Marks, you'll hear about him next, I think perfectly captures the story of how this community gained a foothold. She says, well, there was this business in Greenwich for sale. He knew nothing about it, but he bought the newspaper business. And from then on, you know, if a Jewish person has a little business, they get a bigger one. So we opened up a stationery store. They were all of a kind. They all came in, bought retail shops, and made a living out of it. Philip Marx started a newspaper route in 1904, located in Lower Greenwich Avenue, and later moved to this store at 42 Greenwich Avenue. Like Meyer Cohen and I.J. Weiss, he went into business with a relative, whom he later bought out after the relationship soured. Jenny says, I remember my father on a Sunday morning getting up at two o'clock in the morning, going to the station and getting the newspapers. We all folded the papers. They delivered papers in Greenwich, came home at 12 o'clock, changed horses, and went out to Round Hill to deliver more papers. That's the way people worked, just to make a living. He always used to say that the horse was better than the car. The horse knew when to stop when we had to deliver a paper, but a car never knew. Uh, both Philip Marx and his future wife, Sophia Fox, shown here, came from the same town on the borderline of Russia and Germany, unknown to each other. Philip emigrated in 1880 at the age of 12, joining his father, a fruit peddler, who had come five years earlier. Philip and Sophia's daughter, Jenny, was the first Jewish child born in Greenwich in 1895, and you can see her birth certificate in the exhibition. We were just this week given this rare photograph of the interior of the favorite shoe store, the, the exhibition's signature image that you saw on the outside. So it's not even in the exhibition. A descendant of the Weisses just found it and gave it to me. Now you get a chance to look inside the store as well as outside at the time I.J. Weiss started the business in 1906. The store began as Weiss and Silver, Victor Silver being I.J.'s brother-in-law. Silver is shown on the left and I.J. on the right. And you can see all the shoe boxes and exactly the way it was in 1906. Um, we can date the photo from about 1906 to 1914 because that's when I.J. bought Silver out and changed the name to the favorite shoe store. Uh, Jenny tells the story about how I.J. found this business on Greenwich Avenue. He came with a friend to Lewis Marx's son's bris, or circumcision, and they passed by the store, which was empty. And my father said to his friend, I think it would make a very nice shoe store. He knew nothing about the business at all. Nothing. <coughs> very much like Philip Marx. <laughs> He had emigrated from Hungary around 1900 at the age of 16, first to New York and then to East Portchester, where he had an uncle. He started out peddling fruits and vegetables by horse and wagon along the Byram shore. 
and then he stumbled on the store. He and Fanny and their first two boys lived with the Coens after moving to Porchester, moving from Porchester, until an apartment became available above their store. The older Jewish families would help the new Jewish ones. Ricky Weiss Arcade, granddaughter of IJ and Fanny, who ran the shop for many of its later years, the business stayed in business for 91 years, fortunately had saved many wonderful artifacts from the store that we were thrilled to exhibit. And here you'll see the favorite shoe store box and the balloon blower and the brush. There are many more actually in, in the exhibition. <laughs> Meyer and Rebecca Bennett started a grocery store on Steamboat Road, living above it and raising their five children. It was a Royal Scarlet store which was part of a chain, kind of like a 1940s stop and shop, that Meyer Bennett purchased in 1909 after peddling and working as a manual laborer at Marr Brothers. In later generations, the Royal Scarlet name disappeared and it became Bennett's Grocery, known to the local as, locals as Uncle Meyer's. Meyer was born in 1885 in Lithuania, emigrated to England, and then to New York. He came to Greenwich joining his brother Sam and sister, married sister Leah, whose husband owned a grocery store in Cos Cobb. Here are some artifacts from the original Bennett grocery store on Steamboat Road. You can see the old receipt holder and the receipt pad. And there are other things that the Bennetts um, contributed to the exhibition. After living above the store on Steamboat Road for 18 years, serving in World War II and marrying Dorothy, Carl Bennett, the youngest child of Meyer and Rebecca, moved with his bride to Stanford in 51. They couldn't find housing in Greenwich at that time. And they started a discount department store called Caldors, joining their two names, Carl and Dorothy, in rented space in Porchester, shown here where the rents were cheaper than in Stamford and Greenwich. They soon branched out from hard goods and appliances to clothing and expanded with the purchase of a two-store chain in Stamford and Riverside. Caldors eventually grew to include 133 stores from New Hampshire to Maryland. And here's a great photograph of Carl and Dorothy on the left inside the original Caldors in Porchester, so you can see the, um, what it actually looked like. Here's the Tunic family. They started a different kind of business, a junk business. We don't have an image of the Tunic place of business, but we know that after settling in Porchester around 1900, Barney and Sarah Tunic bought two houses on Bruce, in Bruce Park in 1911, shown here on Indian Harbor Drive. The family was able to operate its automotive business from that location, which included a barn for three horses used to pick up junk or scrap metal by wagon before they acquired a Model T truck. They then moved into the used car business and finally diversified into post-World War II US government army vehicles and parts, which they sold to foreign governments and even the state of Israel. And here's the bell that I was telling you about, that David Tunick, the son of Barney, who oral history we had, recalled that he treasured as a memory of his father's life as a junk dealer. Finally, the sixth family, thanks for staying with me, for all six. After coming to this small community, of Cos Cobb from New York's Lower East Side in 1910, Michael and Fanny Taylor started a newspaper route from this building. You can see the property on this 1938 map. If you can see where it says Fanny Taylor in that blue part and then right below it, it says, uh, no, it says Michael, I think, in the blue and then Fanny right below it. Then they began to develop a vision for Cos Cobb, 
starting with the general store far left. And I don't know if you can make out the one all the way on the left does say Taylor on the top. Oh, I'm sorry. If you go all the way, if you see all the way on the left, uh, very faintly you see the name Taylor on that store. They started that general store, and it grew to include many other neighborhood stores, such as a delicatessen, post office, hardware store. They purchased property, built the stores, and rented them to other merchants to create the Coscob hub or shopping district. I'm not sure that people today are aware of the important role that a Jewish family played in building Coscob. That Michael and Fanny Taylor, in fact, donated the land for both the Coscob Firehouse and Library. We were excited, by the way, to find this 1925 postcard quite recently in the Historical Society's uh, collection, because it's, it's quite early. So where did these families live and why? Mostly, as I've mentioned, they lived above the stores for economic reasons, and perhaps due to discrimination as well. This 1912-1913 directory lists the store and home locations of the Cohen, Marx, and Weiss families as evidence of this. But Sadie said, quote, of course when I grew older I resented living on the avenue, but it was unthinkable not to be near your business then. So what was it like to live and work in Greenwich as such a tiny minority? Did these Jewish newcomers experience anti-Semitism? Did they feel welcome? This is what Sadie Cohen, Jenny Marks, and Jenny Weiss said. Sadie says, you couldn't buy property in certain areas, certain places, and I had a feeling it was better not to mingle. Because we were in business, and as long as everything was all right in business, it was better probably not to get too involved. I ne so I never cared to, particularly. And then Jenny Weiss says, we never bought a house. It was nothing anybody would object to. It was a business property. She's referring to the, the building on uh, 92 Greenwich Avenue. And then Jenny Marks says, you couldn't date anybody. You couldn't go out. And when the holidays came, we had to go to Portchester. So it seems from these oral histories that the Jewish community kept to themselves under the radar and yet enjoyed a warm neighborhood feeling on the avenue. As Jenny Weiss says, all the neighbors in the summer would come out at six o'clock. There was no traffic and the kids would play. It was a little neighborhood. And elsewhere in other of the oral histories, they talk about the only time the street was busy was when the wealthy people took the train in the morning and came back at night, and the rest of the time they had their community on the street. So look at these four Jewish kids in this photograph on Upper Greenwich Avenue, opposite Acker Merrill, which was at 53 Greenwich Avenue. Two of them are Walter and Jenny Weiss. It's dated about 1915. The fo this photograph I also just got from that descendant of the Weiss family. And I was thrilled to find it because it's a candid shot of life on the street, something I had never seen. You can see a horse, trolley tracks, some of the same buildings standing today. And we're assuming that the children are all Jewish from the Greenwich Hebrew Institute kind of group at that time. Ten newly settled Jewish families gathered in 1916 to form the Greenwich Hebrew Institute, the town's first Jewish house of worship, where they could educate their children in Jewish learning and traditions. Um, all the other uh, houses of worship in like Stamford and Hartford and Haven were all predated 1916. This was kind of the last one. Among the founders were the same pioneering Jewish merchants of Greenwich Avenue that we've already met. Meyer Cohen, I.J. Weiss, Meyer Bennett, Sarah Tunick, Philip Marks. In 1917, the, Jewish, the Institute received it, uh, had its first High Holy Days services in Abrams Hall, which was rented space on Greenwich Avenue. Two years later, they were granted a charter, and the congregation purchased a small house on East Elm Street. 
This is the first uh, graduating class, the first class of the Greenwich Hebrew Institute, and many of the children of the founding shopkeepers are shown. Um, Walter and Jenny Weiss, Sarah and Frank Bennett, George Tunick. For more than three generations after its beginnings, the Jewish community of Greenwich comprised a very small proportion of the town's population, much smaller than in other towns and cities in Fairfield County, such as nearby Stamford. In part, this was due to the town's tightly controlled town as opposed to city form of governance, which enabled it to enact strict zoning laws that deterred commercial development as well as lower income residents which often included Jews and African Americans. Part of the town's identity as an elite bedroom community of New York City. Nonetheless, anti-Semitism ebbed and flowed. The generation of the first Jewish families and their children, despite their low numbers, seemed to have experienced little overt discrimination. The merchants chose to live above their stores, as I've said, but also because it was difficult to purchase um, homes in the residential districts, as Sadie mentioned, due to an unwritten gentleman's agreement. And many of the yacht clubs, like Riverside, shown here, were also off limits to Jews and blacks. But the next generation experienced heightened discrimination. Here's a quote from someone who came of age in the 1940s that specifically um, concerns yacht club exclusivity. My father took me for sailing lessons down to the yacht club and we were in line. And when they got to us, they said, oh no, not you. That was the kind of town it was. I fought my way home from school a lot and my brother did too. I decided to go to boarding school. And this ad in the Greenwich Time from June 8, 1939 describes the subdivision of Yale Farms as highly restricted meaning off limits to Jews and other minorities. Members of today's Jewish community still recall seeing similar signs on much backcountry property in the area up until the early 1960s. The Hillcrest Park community, however, developed by Joseph Sawyer in the 1920s on the fringe of Old Greenwich and bordering Stanford was an exception to the real estate industry's restricted policies. Like many American Jews, Jewish men and women from Greenwich felt a particular pull to join the war against Nazi Germany. Many voluntarily enlisted rather than get drafted. Here's the wife of Max Taylor of Kos Cobb in a WAC uniform. And here's David Resnick in uniform with his parents in 1941. Uh, his brother Aaron was killed in the war. We think the only Jewish soldier from Greenwich to have met that fate. Carl Bennett's dog tag shows a letter H, a letter H on the bottom right. After November 10th, 1941, US Army issued dog tags included religion for burial purposes, designated an H for Hebrew, C for Catholic, and P for Protestant. Sometimes Jewish soldiers were urged to change their tag from H to C or P, due to the fear of harsh treatment if they were captured by the Nazis. Isidore Pinker joined the Marx newspaper family when he married Harriet Levine, the granddaughter of Philip Marx. Note the optometrist emblem on the jacket. Isidore was an optometrist who lived in Greenwich but practiced in Stanford. Housing discrimination lingered for quite a long time even into the post-war period, as this shocking directive at a, at a real estate agency attests. Oops, not there yet. It says, when anyone telephones us in answer to an ad in any newspaper and their name is or appears to be Jewish, do not meet them anywhere. These people are everywhere and just roam from one broker to another hoping to get in to Greenwich. However, this letter helped, or this directive at the real estate agency, did help to initiate 
fair housing campaigns both in Greenwich and elsewhere in the state. After World War II, America entered a period of unprecedented economic prosperity. With the help of the federal government, suburbia became the predominant way of life. These trends were transforming Greenwich, and many more Jewish families were able to settle there after the lingering housing and other forms of discrimination ended in the mid-60s. This photo of Rose and Sidney Grossman in front of their newly opened shoe store in 1940 is emblematic of this time. And there were many others to join this second wave of Jewish businesses to open up on Greenwich Avenue. Roven's Curtain Shop, the Clam Box Restaurant in Cobb, Granite's Pharmacy, Richard's Clothing, to name a few. This 1938 property map serves as a base map for the many Jewish-owned businesses that operated in the town from 1899 to 1960s. The historical data um, was researched and compiled by Elsa Gordon, who happens to be sitting right here with us. Um, so these were the businesses that were started uh, in over this period of time, and the red ones, um, hard to see. The red ones over here were started between 1900 and 1930, and they're on the upper end of the avenue. The lion's share of the businesses were between 1930 and 1960. They're shown in blue, and they're more dispersed along the avenue. And then very few were started in the 60s, um, and they're shown in gray. These two these two photos show the evolution of change on the avenue during this half century, from the 1890s to 1962. The same view, same exact view on Greenwich Avenue actually looking up at this building, or what used to be this building. Um, a visual accompaniment to the map that you just saw. With the growth of the Jewish community, Jewish religious observance began to diversify as well. Currently, Greenwich is home to seven Jewish religious organizations. Greenwich Reform Synagogue, Congregation Shira Mi, Chabad Lubavitch of Greenwich, Hebrew Wizards, Carmel Academy, Shaburad Devray Torah, in addition to the town's largest, Temple Shalom. This shows I.J. Weiss holding the cornerstone to Temple Shalom's first building on Putnam Road. With the growth of population, the Greenwich Hebrew Institute began to outgrow its small building on East Elm Street, and it sold that to the town and built this building in 1955 when it changed its name to Temple Shalom. The UJA of Greenwich was also established in 55, and today there's also a local JCC. In 1987, a synagogue and a church in Greenwich started an innovative and what some might call a long overdue effort to promote brotherhood, mutual respect, and understanding. Temple Shalom and Christ Episcopal Church organized a path-breaking interfaith weekend. When neighbors get together, the Jewish-Christian connection and the Passover-Easter connection. Both congregations attended services at both houses of worship, where sermons were delivered by reverend and rabbi. They also published this beautiful bound book to commemorate the project. Like Greenwich Reform Synagogue, Congregation Shira Me is also a Reformed Jewish congregation, and this Torah cover and ornaments belong to a Torah dating from the 1880s that was given to the congregation by one of its members. It was saved from destruction during the Holocaust by a Catholic family in a Polish village when the Jews from that village were deported by the Nazis to concentration camps. The congregation later found Jewish survivors from the village living in the US and reconnected them to their lost Torah. Temple Shalom expanded in 1991 and 2000, and Greenwich Reform Synagogue just built a brand new synagogue in 2017, just a few months ago, moving from its longtime home on Stanwich Road. This construction speaks to how far the Jewish community has come in Greenwich. So 
So the original businesses that were started by the first Jews to make Greenwich their home are gone. You can see the buildings of three of the businesses here as they were then and now. The favorite shoe store became Lily Pulitzer. Marx Brothers became AT&T. And here's the hub in 1940 and, and 2017. But this small community of outsiders, despite their experiencing periods of discrimination in worship, unemployment, and housing, eventually grew to have an outsized presence in the town. And some of Greenwich's financially successful Jewish families of the 20th and 21st centuries have also left their philanthropic mark on the town. Just as wealthy Greenwich families in prior eras like the Havemeyers or the Bruces have. Beyond the philanthropy though, the Jewish newcomers of a century ago built a community that has riched Greenwich immeasurably. It helped make Greenwich a more culturally rich and diverse place. And here's our view of the gallery. One of the, um, one of the rooms in the gallery showing you a little bit about what the exhibition looks like. So I hope you all will come to see it if you haven't yet. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm wondering what contributions you might cite of the community's contribution to the medical profession or even in the cemeteries to various parts of life uh, or communities. The cemeteries, did you say? The medical profession and branch, the contribution to the medical profession and branch, the hospitals, you name it, and also potentially what did they do for cemeteries? Who are they? Um, actually, at the end of the exhibition, we talk about um, contributions that many of these families have made to the medical um, world. The Bennetts gave money, the Bendheims. Is, is, that, is that, am I answering that question correctly? Um, and the, this is financially successful uh, families, Jewish families. That was a big area of philanthropy to the town um, to strengthen the health care in Greenwich and also in Stanford. As for the cemeteries, interesting you mentioned that. In 1908, there was uh, the Hebrew cemetery. We, I didn't include it in this slideshow. It's on the map of a 1908 map um, that was started, a Jewish cemetery in 1908. And it was very common that even before you had the establishment of a congregation, you would start, the first thing you would do, you would start a burial ground. So that was 1908, and the congregation didn't even get organized till 1916. But yeah, they had, they had to find a place to bury uh, their people, and that was the first thing that they did. Um, hope that answers your question. Hello, I was uh, a big fan of the Marx Brothers Stationery Store. I was wondering what happened to the family? Are they still local, or what happened to the business? Um, I think Elsa knows better the answer to that. Do you want to answer? Hi. Um, the store was sold to the Pinkett's family, um, and I'm not sure on all the dates, but um, they ran the store exactly like the, like the Marx Brothers had run it in the same place and with all the same wooden cases and everything. Um, and, but eventually, and, and they were another Jewish family, but eventually they did, they were a black business, so that's what happened. And, and yes, and Mark's brother's descendants do live here in town, still. Yeah, we tried to get in touch with the, the family that bought the Marx Brothers store because apparently they had a typewriter that was the old one from the original store. We really, really, really wanted to put that in the show, but it didn't happen, so yeah. All right. Uh, growing up in Greenwich, um, what you always heard about a famous Jewish family were the hair shortens. Now, you mentioned that they were uh, land uh, wealthy, really, but um, they were very, very prominent in the town of Greenwich. Um, secondly, the stores on Greenwich Avenue uh, tell the story of, of all of you know, and my folks were uh, Irish, and they had restaurants, 
you know, and there was uh, at the bottom of Greenwich Avenue, the stores uh, such as the Bingo Market, for instance, and there were two or three that were Jewish owned, and my folks had to run across the street if they ran out of food, you know, and buy right on the street, you know, from the Jewish. Thing. There was great, uh, 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 great friendship between the Irish and the Jewish folks. It really was. It was uh, uh, very, very nice and very healthy. So I just add that for your, your comments. Yeah, thank That's you. That's a good point. The question about the contributions of the Jewish families, but then on Cancer Center at Greenwich Hospital, the uh, Glendale Community Center by the Ben Times, the art gallery at the senior center is the Ben Time Gallery. Uh, that's just one example. The, the Bennetts, uh, Carl Bennett and Dorothy, who founded the Caldors, uh, the, the large cancer center at the Sanford Hospital is the Bennett Cancer Center. Uh, and, and there are a number of other major contributions to uh, the town parks uh, that have been underwritten by members of the Jewish community in Greenwich. Uh, one other thing, of course, is that today uh, Greenwich is known as the uh, hedge fund capital, uh, and a large percentage of the hedge funds are founded and headed by uh, Jews who now live in Greenwich. Uh, it's it's a, a, a very significant change from what it was as late as the mid-1960s, when uh, there were still a gentleman's agreement in much of central Greenwich, for sure, uh, where Jews could not buy a home. So a lot has changed. I, I, I would mention one other thing. The hope is that the uh, Greenwich Retired Men's Association might uh, put together one of its group events and bring a whole group of people uh, from the uh, association uh, to uh, the Historical Society to see the exhibition. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, brochures as you leave, but also there include uh, little tickets for free admission uh, to the exhibition, but a, a group tour uh, would also be most welcome. Catalog, uh, is, is with, with the other paper, with the brochure, you see that there is in preparation now, as soon as it be completed, a written uh, brochure catalog uh, that uh, puts all of the information that uh, Dr. Morrison has spoken about in printed form with photographs and text uh, that it will be available for purchase from the Greenwich Historical Society. Thank you very, very much for coming and talking to us.